to be built up in you. Draw us close, Lord, hold us close. And may uh, you allow us to learn everything you want us to learn in reference to the revelation of your Son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Take a moment for everybody here and say hello to each other. So I'm 
not real quick, but uh, hopefully we're, we're learning things in depth, and I know I am learning things. So our, our source scripture tonight is Revelation 1, 1 and 2. If you're ready for the Word of God, please signify that by saying amen. amen. And if you are ready, would you still please stand for the reading of God's Holy Word. Revelation 1, 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he went and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. You can be seated. Thank you. Approximately 70% of the verses in the book of Revelation allude to the Old Testament. And thus, a study of, uh, any study of Revelation will place heavy emphasis on those scriptures. Revelation describes God as holy. It describes Him as true. It describes Him as being omnipotent. It describes Him as being wise and sovereign and, of course, eternal. It addresses man and mankind, our depravity, and while experiencing the final outpouring of God's devastating wrath and judgment on that sinful mankind, we will still see that nevertheless people will harden their hearts and still refuse to repent. There is in Scripture no clearer summation of the doctrine of redemption than what is contained in the second half of the first, of fifth verse of the first chapter. Revelation 1.5, the second half says, Him, Him being Jesus Christ, who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. We can hang on to just that, that one part of that one verse. It really can open up new avenues of our life as we experience Jesus in our life daily. Revelation reveals to us the ministry of angels. With 25% of all the angelic scripture references in the Bible are contained in this one book. So we can learn a lot about the ministry of angels when we look at the book of Revelation. Revelation is a wealth of information for the church. It tells the church of the dangers of sin. It warns the church of the dangers of compromise with the word. That's in chapters 2 and 3. And then it teaches the church how to proper, properly worship our Father. That's in chapters 4 and 5. I will not attempt to seek evidence for any of my own views as we begin this study. I don't think that's appropriate. This eschatological study, and estakos in Greek, uh, for those of you that don't know, I spent five years in, in Greece, in Athens, Greece, Eschatos means last. Of course, ology means the study of. Last study. And in this last study, it's not my desire to force upon you any of what I personally believe. I want to just look at the Word and see what the Word shows us we need to believe. The point of Revelation isn't that it affords me an opportunity to show you how, to show you how much I know. Because really, I don't know that much. I will be learning just as much as you will as we go through this study. The point of Revelation is, is that it's rich in details of the end time. And for that we should be thankful. And to understand what it says to us is enough. We don't need to add anything to it. And I can say one thing here today, and I've said it before to our church body. I know one thing, that today we are one day closer to Jesus coming than we were yesterday. And I pray He would come. And I hope that He'll come. And I know that He will come because He is my hope. And in Him I have my security. But we don't need to put our unique spin on things. I used to know a pastor who I studied under who used to say he knew a lot of people that were full of heavenly knowledge. But they were of no earthly good. I want to help us find earthly goodness in this book as we try to study and try to see what it has for us. Revelation portrays Christ's ultimate triumph over Satan. He depicts the final, it shows us the final political setup of the entire world system. In our Wednesday night study, we've been studying the religions of the world 
And most recently, we have studied the religion of Islam, and we see a lot of similarities with end times philosophy in regards to the Antichrist and the 12th Imam, or the Mahdi. And we will, we will examine some of those same things that we've discussed in that Wednesday night study. The book of Revelation describes the rapture of the church. It speaks to the seven-year tribulation, including the second three and a half years, which is the great tribulation, and we should consider it that way, and we should label it that way and in our hearts and in our minds. It tells us of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It tells us of the climatic battle of human history, Armageddon. It speaks to the thousand-year earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. It talks about the final uh, judgment of unrepentant sinners, the great white throne judgment. And then it talks about the final stages of humanity, the wicked spending eternity in hell, the lake of fire, and the redeemed in the new heaven and the new earth. How blessed we are to be God's people. But what the book of Revelation is preeminently, more than anything else, is the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the name of the book. And the book of Revelation tells us so much about who our Lord and Savior is. I'll list a few of the descriptions. And the, the great thing is, is that we're going to get an opportunity to study each and every one of, us, of these. But it describes him as the faithful witness. It calls him the firstborn from the dead. It calls him the ruler of the kings of the earth. It says that he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He is, it says, the living one. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven lampstands. It says that he is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. He is, it says, the Son of God. He is the one who is described as having eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. He is the one who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The one who is holy, who is true. He is the holder of the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. He is the Amen. He is the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of the creation of God, the Lion that is from the tribe of Judah. He is the Root of David, the Lamb of God, the Lord, holy and true, the one who is called faithful and true, the Word of God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is Christ, Messiah, ruling on the earth with His glorified saints. He is Jesus, the Root of and the descendant of David, he's the bright and morning star. That's a lot of revelation. And as I said, we're going to get the opportunity to look at each one of those phrases word by word. And I'm excited that we have that opportunity in this environment to do that. This book also affirms the fullness of the deity of Jesus Christ. By that I mean he possesses the attributes and the prerogatives of God including sovereignty, eternity. He has the right, it says, to judge all men and decide who lives and who dies. He also receives worship. He rules from God's throne. And finally, Revelation affirms his equality of essence, you can use that word, with God the Father by applying Old Testament passages that describe God will be used in the book of Revelation to describe Jesus. Christ. We will look at all those scriptures in the future. This is far from being a mysterious book. It's far from being incomprehensible. Uh, Revelation's purpose is to reveal truth. That's what it's about. It's not to obscure the truth. It's not to be mysterious in nature. What sense would that make for God? God desires that His Son be revealed to us in His fullness, so that we can fully understand Him. That fact is evident, as we've already said in the title, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, we will see primarily in His second coming in glory. That's when we will really understand.
understand who Jesus Christ is. But the, the revelation, the Greek word, apokalupsis, apokalupsis, uh, means to uncover or to unveil. Uh, kind of like when we have the Lord's Supper and we uncover and then unveil the elements that, before we partake of them. It's kind of that same idea. And throughout the New Testament, you'll find the word used. It's generally used to speak about a spiritual truth which is revealed. In Romans 16, 25, it says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. All expressing the idea, you have now had some of these things revealed for, to you. Galatians 1.12, For I neither received it from man, nor was taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. How did Paul know all the things that he knew about Jesus Christ? Well, they had been revealed. You see that ex expressly in Corinthians, where he speaks about uh, the Lord's Supper. His knowledge of the Lord's Supper uh, indicates that he had had a discussion with Jesus Christ about the Lord's Supper. And there's several other uses of that word in the book of Ephesians. It's also used of the manifestation of the sons of God, as it says in Romans 8.19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing, it says, of the sons of God. And we'll, we'll examine that phrase, sons of God, some more later. It's also used for the manifestation of Christ. It's used to describe His first coming. Way back in Luke 2.32, it says, I like to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And then, in 2 Thessalonians 1.7, at the opposite end of the spectrum, it says, And to give you our troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. It's used to describe the birth of Christ, and then it's used to describe the second coming. In 1 Peter 1 7, it says, That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, the genuineness of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I know I'm listing a lot of scripture for you, and for those that, of you that don't always come to study with us, all the scriptures that I recite are listed at the bottom of your outline. And there's two outlines tonight. One is the lesson outline of this first lesson, and the second outline is an outline of the entire book, and I'll talk to that later on. But that book outline will be available during the entire study in case somebody joins with us later. All of our outlines are online at newlifebenson.com. And all of our sermons are online. If you go to newlifebenson.com, there's a YouTube link. All you've got to do is hit that YouTube link. And you can, you can see everything that we've got since we've been in this building. But in each case, that word, apple. Apocalypsis, which we get an apocalypse from, is used to describe something or someone that was formerly hidden from us, but now has become visible to us, at least to the ability that we have to understand. In the book of Revelation, we have, we have the truth about Christ made visible that are only hinted about in the Old Testament and in the other New Testament books. Revelation reveals to us a wealth of information about who Jesus Christ is. It brings him into greater clarity, and we need to know who Jesus Christ is because we are to grow in his image. When we wake up tomorrow, we should look more like Jesus than when we woke up today. We're to grow into, into, into that image. That's our walk in holiness, which we participate in each and every day. So the clarity we receive here is often obscured by some by the rejection of principles of what I will call literal interpretation in favor of other types of interpretation. Some will use allegorical interpretation where they, they take characters and events and
and they try to use them to symbolize ideas and concepts. I call that a spiritualization of the book of Revelation, and I don't think it's needed to, to be done. Oftentimes, what happens with that type of teaching is that people try to place Revelation's account in the past or in the present rather than in the future. But when we go beyond the plain meaning of the text, that whenever an interpreter does that, then he gets to do one thing that he doesn't need to do. He gets to use his own <coughs> imagination. And imagination is not necessary for the Word of God. The Word of God is holy and true, and we don't need to use our imagination. We need to try to figure out what it's saying to us. The truths of this book can become lost in a maze of human inventions. I've read some really far-fetched ideas in regards to the book of Revelation. And when they do that, they become void of authenticity. Now, there isn't much need to discuss the author himself. John self-identifies himself four times in the book of Revelation. Justin Martyr wrote, uh, probably I think around 135 A.D., he wrote that there was a certain man with us whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ, who prophesied by a revelation that was made to him, that those who believed in our Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem, and thereafter the general, and in short, the eternal resurrection and judgment of all men would likewise take place. There are numerous other affirmations of the authorship of John. And I believe the, the writing that is generally given for the book of Revelation around 96 AD is a good date. There's another school of thought that teaches that it was written around 68 AD, but I believe the preponderance of evidence would lead us to find the latter date the most likely. And remember, if we accept that latter dating of Revelation, then we eliminate the possibility that some of the prophecy, prophecies contained in Revelation were, were fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We will not look at it from that direction. We will look at it as if it was written approximately 96 AD. So let's talk a little bit about interpretation. Without a doubt, Revelation, because of the imagery, because of the symbols, and because of the language, is one of the most challenging books of the Bible to interpret. And there's really four schools, four approaches on how to interpret Revelation. The first is the preterist view. And the preterist view approaches Revelation not as future prophecy, but as a historical record of events in the first century Roman Empire. Personally, I've never given that interpretive option much credence since to attempt it as being correct in, in its nature, you would have to ignore the book's own claims towards prophecy. And we can't, uh, we can't ignore those claims for prophecy. Earlier we looked at 1-3, blessed is he who reads and hears the words of this prophecy. We read 22-7, well, behold I am coming quickly, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then later in chapter, in verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. I don't believe, and then even later on in that same uh, chapter, it's 18 and 19, speak to the prophecy of the book. So I don't believe we can look at Revelation from a historical perspective. Besides this, and not all the prophecies, Besides that one point, not all the prophecies noted in Revelation were fulfilled in the first century. Most obvious, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're still waiting, waiting for that. So the preterist viewpoint, in my opinion, doesn't hold any water. The second uh, school of interpretation of Revelation is the historicist approach. And this approach treats Revelation as a record of church history from apostolic times to the present time. Interpreters in this camp attempt to give represent, representation of abstract or spiritual uh, ideas through contra, concrete historic, historical events. That's why it's called by the name it's called. See, whenever man 
places his own interpretation on the Word of God, he has to try to fit things into holes. And oftentimes he has square pegs, and he's trying to fit them into round holes. And that just doesn't work. The Word of God will reveal itself to us when we are, when we are loyal to it, when we endeavor to understand it. God will give you the discernment that He desires you to have. When we become what we call here thoroughgoing Bible people, God will reveal His truth to us. The, uh, the problem with this historicist approach is that this form of interpretation lends itself to a myriad of conflicting interpretations of the actual historical event. You don't need to uh, apply your own spin to these events. Many of these events have happened. Most of these, there's a whole myriad of events that are going to happen, and you know what? I think some of them are happening today. We've seen some of the realization of this thing. So here, each interpreter, under the historical or historicist approach, each interpreter invents his own interpretation of the spiritual meaning of each one of the events in the Scripture. And I don't think that's the way the Lord would have us approach it. The third approach is the idealist approach, which sees revelation as a timeless struggle between good and evil that is played out in every age, repetitively. This approach sees revelation as neither a historical re record. It also doesn't see it as predictive in nature. It's not a prophecy. And as with the prior two approaches, this view also ignores Revelation's claim to be prophetic in nature. Under this approach, Revelation becomes really a collection of myths. And if people that use this type of interpretive process go back and they look at they look at myths of the Romans and the Greeks and they show how all of these things are all intertwined and they're all about the same thing. But they're not all about the same thing. The book of Revelation is totally unique unto itself. It's a, it's a, it's a, each and every word is totally unique. So you can't discuss, describe it as a, a collection of myths. It's a collection of truth. truths, which we will see, I believe, maybe even evidenced in our time. Finally, there is the futurist approach. And that approach sees chapters 4 through 22 of Revelation as people and events yet to come in the future. Or maybe, as I've already said, even beginning to be fulfilled now. This approach allows Revelation to be interpreted following the same method, method that I believe the rest of the Bible should be interpreted by. This approach pays proper respect to Revelation's claim to be prophecy. While this approach is criticized by some of, as robbing revelation of any meaning for those to whom it was written, in other words, at the time that the book was written, they'll say, well, that, that stuff didn't pertain to the, those people. It was talking about distant events in the future. But that criticism doesn't hold any water at all. Because what are the Old Testament prophecies? Those were prophecies that were written about things that were going to happen way in the future, such as the coming Messiah. So that criticism, how about Daniel's prophecy? That criticism that they're too far out in the future, that it didn't hold, it didn't have things for the people it was written to, and that criticism isn't any good anyway. It, that criticism, criticism just muddies the water. I believe that anything other than the futurist approach leaves the meaning of the book to human ingenuity and opinion. And I don't want to be a genius, and I really don't want to have any opinion except one, and that's God's opinion. So rather than uh, uh, trying to put a spin on things, let's just try to find out what it is God wants from us. It's not our viewpoint that matters, it's His viewpoint that matters. So we're going to examine the text in a very straightforward way. At least that's what we will attempt to do. So I'm not going to examine all four approaches as we go through the Bible. 
or the book of Revelation, because that will confuse us. It will confuse me. I'm going to use the futurist approach. And as I try to teach and preach it, I'm going to use my normal style of what I call systematic language interpretation. I intend to examine each word in the Greek and then to try to figure out what each word means to us as we go through the process. Now I've provided you with an outline from the, from the, for the entire book and I've taken that outline from John MacArthur and uh, it's not in any way unique. It's a good division of the books. It's a, a commonly used division of the book and that outline will be available as I said throughout the study for anyone that might join us and encourage your friends to come. But the first 20 verses of the book of Revelation in the outline are entitled Things Which You Have Seen and the you there are the people to whom the book was being written at that particular time. Starting with the second chapter and ending with the third we see the things which are current events. Uh, those reading this book at that time of the initial distribution would recognize those things as things that were current to them. It would be almost like reading their local paper. And then with, beginning with chapter 4 to the end of the book, we have the things that will take place after this. And that's a look into the future, the future events that will mold the end times of mankind. Now this is going to be, as I said, quite an endeavor, and I hope you're up to it, and I hope that you'll pray for me as we attempt to, to find the truth of what God has for us in the book of Revelation. There's nothing I'd rather do than to teach the, the Word, verse by verse, word by word, so I will be in my element. I just hope that I can help you to stay with me so that we'll all be in the same element together. Let's pray. Father, we... Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, divide your word, Lord, to examine it, to try to understand it with greater depth, with greater knowledge. And as we go about this, Lord, I, I, I pray that uh, you will hide us behind your cross, the cross that your son died on for us, because, Father, Satan always desires that we not learn. He wants us to be too busy to be apathetic. He wants us to have other things to do, other ways to do things. So I just ask, Lord, that you would help us to be steadfast in our desires. And Lord, uh, whatever you might <coughs> reveal to us, that's our desire, to, re to receive revelation from you. So help us, Lord, to, to hang on to you, to be faithful and to, to seek you in all things and all ways in regards to this study. I thank you, Lord, for those that have come. It's very, very encouraging. And you know, Father, I oftentimes need encouragement. I'm often my own worst, worst critic. And for that, Father, I ask your forgiveness. But, Father, as we, as we attempt to find out what you have for us, help us, Lord, to be uh, faithful and true. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to seek you. We know, Father, that you are always faithful. You never leave us nor forsake us. And for that, Lord, we are eternally grateful. So, Father, we uh, lift up this time to you. May, uh, may it be rewarding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In every session that we have, we always uh, close our Sunday night studies with question and answer time. So, we don't really, I don't think there's too many questions you might have, although you may have some, and you can go ahead and ask them. But tonight would be a good night for comments. If you have any thoughts, about the book of Revelation. I know some of you have taught the book of Revelation. Some of you have probably studied the book of Revelation numerous times, more times than me. So you have to be willing to share your knowledge with me also. Yes, Marty? Well, I can't get the, the definition of preterist. A, a preterist? P-R-E-T. P-R-I-S-T. -E yeah, it's in, yeah, it's in your outline. It's one that it's one that looks at everything from a historical perspective. Oh, it's a sort of well, this is yeah. the record of church. Preterist or preterist would probably preterist. be. Preterist think that everything is fulfilled before seven. Yeah. They think everything has already happened. Okay. Everything that's written in the book. Anyone else? Do you believe that the Bible is a pyramid like Genesis and Revelation? Do 
Do I believe the Bible was in a pyramid and kind of coded? I don't. I don't know. I've never. I don't. I've never examined that that, that idea or thought. I don't. I'm pretty simple. It sounds difficult to me. Anybody else? Nobody else? Sign is a big word, John. The revelation is for the symptoms. How do we get how do we understand the symptoms of this by going back to the Old Testament? And we'll examine that word when we when we get to that particular word. He's talking about uh, in the opening where it talks about the signs that were revealed to John. And if you look at John's writing, John uses uh, in, in reference to miracles. John uses a different word in the gospel for miracles than everybody else uses. John uses a word that means signs. Because John, John likes to use that, John likes the idea that these are things, all these miracles did one thing. They were a sign that pointed to Jesus Christ. They were basically a sign to the Jews who yes. really needed the sign. And John, John wrote to the, the Jew in mind. So, and Edward's right, and we'll look at that word when we get to that particular word in, in some depth. So, anyone else? Okay, let's all stand. We attempt to hold hands and make a circle. We're pretty good at holding hands, but we struggle with circles.